sorry, it takes a few seconds to get the live stream going. Just one sec. No problem. Huh. Wait, let me, it gave an error. Sorry, sometimes YouTube is a little... That's okay. We can wait. I have the screen sharing going and get ready. Another try here. As a backup, we could just record it locally and then post it, but the live stream is nice. Let me try one more time. Oh, yeah. YouTube is... Uh... Really good. Because usually we get questions on the live stream too. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me, I, I should try to monitor that. Okay, well, I don't want to... How about this? It's giving me an error. There must be something with the Zoom YouTube connection. Let's get the recording going locally. And then I'll be trying to do the live stream in the background. But I don't want to hold us up. So let me just get the record. Okay, the recording is going. Okay, so why don't we just go for it. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, today we have a technical workshop from maintainers of Hyperledger Cacti and community members in the Hyperledger community using Hyperledger Cacti. And we are going to be talking today about standardizing DLT interoperation, implementing IETF, secure asset transfer protocol in Hyperledger Cacti. And we have speakers, uh, several speakers today, Dr. Thomas Harjono, Rafael Belchior, uh, Peter Somigyari, and then Venka Tarama Ramakrishna. And so with that, I will say take it away. And thank you very much for everybody for joining and for the speakers for preparing the workshop today. Hey, uh, should I go first? Uh, Raman and Rafael? Yep. Yes, please, Thomas. Okay, let me just share. Okay, okay, let me try again. Thank you. Okay, uh, folks. So, so uh, good morning, folks. Thank you for joining uh, this call, and thank you for folks who are uh, joining in an evening uh, time zone. Because I know for some people uh, who are like in India, this this would be late night, and you should be in bed instead. So, thank you for taking the extra effort uh, to, to to be joining this. So, today I'm just going to give a. a bit of a background about the secure asset transfer protocol architecture, which is work in the IETF that has been going on for now over three years. Uh, Rama and, and um, uh, Raphael are, are also very active in that uh, community. And I will also explain a bit of background about the IETF and why uh, the original idea of you know, working on Interop was brought to the IETF. So uh, I, this is probably um, Madhu and Apple, but I think I think by now we're very aware of of the uh, interop issues that are facing many layer one blockchains, and so it points to the need for some standards to be developed, particularly standards that give you uh, components that are reusable in different scenarios, right? So, uh, you know, for those who like cars, uh, I, I tend to think of a SATP as a component like a carburetor that you can use in different cars from trucks to um, you know racing cars it does the same thing uh, all over over and over again and it's it's reliable it's good it's proven it's well understood and part of this well understoodness is is a, a big a big deal in the IETF so so uh, what is the sort of bigger picture behind this so so uh, the the asset um ecosystem, the digital assets ecosystem is fairly complex. The world of payments and currencies were already complex even before uh, blockchains you know, uh, came about in about 10 years ago. And so in, in terms of uh, understanding how we can begin to standardize components in the ecosystem, we looked at specific uh, points where uh, connections would, would need to be made between networks or blockchains. Now you'll hear us 
talk about blockchain networks or networks, it means blockchains, it means DLP. Uh, and it, it's because we're so used to moving between those two words, blockchain, blockchain networks, DLP networks. Uh, some people say DLNs, distributed ledger networks and so on. And so the placement of the secure asset transfer protocol is that yellow bit in, in the middle of there. And uh, we, we put this in the context of gateways, gateway G1 and G, uh, G2. So right now the, the protocol specification is defined for a unidirectional transfer from say G1 to G2. And if you want to have bidirectional, you just run a second instance uh, that would implement the transfer the other way, right? So this is this is where we are. The IETF typically does not define ways to implement this. So how you implement a gateway is out of scope. So gateways could be boxes, it could be a cloud-based service, it could be, you know, uh, it could, could be many things. It could be a, a thin shim API behind which you have a database, you know, and so all, all of that is outside the scope of the, the ITF. And in fact, that is the great thing about the ITF is that, uh, you know, the, the way it understands or sub subdivides the problems allows the solutions to be reusable across many uh, you know, many situations. So a good analogy, if you guys understand SSL and TLS, the SSL TLS um, specification, I think it's TLS 1.3 now, that's at least 15 years old or 20 years old. If you look at it, it's, it's defined the same way. You go, you go to client, you go to server, and you get the you know, client hello message, you know, server hello, and so on, so on, so on. It, the specification only defines the protocol flows the content of, of the message, the, the message bodies, and also the APIs. It doesn't tell you how to do a client. It doesn't tell you how to implement the server, which means SSL and TLS uh, can be used, you know, for browser to, you know, merchant website. It could be used, uh, you know, in, as a substitute for VPNs. It could It could be used for, for many things. So this is, this is kind of the scenario and all the gray dotted boxes is all the presumed infrastructure that we will need in order to get to the world of a web three digital assets ecosystem. And um, so you'll see some of the some of the goals and the constraints that so we are we are designing under certain strict constraints. So this is just a formal definition. We like to uh, move uh, data objects that are value bearing. So we call that just asset or digital asset from one network to another. Uh, in such a way that there's, there's no double spending, which is the classic problem. And in such a way that if there's any dispute occurring that you can bring in a third party, whether it's an audit company, you know, or some other entity to actually look and look into both networks, both ledgers and be able to verify that the transfer actually did occur. And if there's any mistakes, errors, or um, dishonest, you know, participants, you can, you can quickly identify which one uh, you know which one uh, to, to 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 look at um desirable properties and constraints so this is the this is one of the big ones right so uh we have to be able to design a secure asset uh, transfer protocol that will work when one or both are private closed dlps okay that means we have no visibility into the ledger we have no visibility into the public keys that are being used by the by the users in the ledger, uh, and so the whole thing is opaque, right? It's just it's just, it's just a, a blob. So that's one requirement. The second requirement is that uh, we don't know what is going to be behind uh, the thing that's that's an endpoint of the SAP P protocol. We don't know what's behind it, and it could be a legacy infrastructure. So in fact, we have uh, a use case and an implementation from one of our participants that. On one side, it's actually an, an RTGS, uh, this is real-time gross settlement system, an RTGS system on one side and a blockchain on the other side, right? So we have to accommodate for this uh, situation. And, and thirdly, we'd like to have the ACID uh, property. So ACID is a classic, um, it, it comes from the classic database textbook of the 70s. This is, if, you, if you're old enough to know who Jim Gray is, this is, this is, uh, this is one of his babies. Um, but basically, ACID says the following. So we, we want atomic transfers. That means the transfer must either commit fail, not, you know, not happen, right? So you want to you want a clean, you want a clean sort of uh, transfer. Consistency. So 
we want to have the scenario where uh, if the tra uh, if the transfer commits or fails, the digital asset uh, must exist only one you know one time in 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 a in a blockchain. In other words, you cannot have a scenario where a fail results in double spending. So uh, a fail results in the the asset in the origin network not yet uh, you know burned, and then it's already minted on the other side. So suddenly you have you have two two copies of the asset, which is which is not uh, desirable. Um, isolation. So what? So while this uh, transfer is occurring, the the asset ownership uh, cannot be modified. In other words, uh, this is again classic database. If you know uh, distributed databases, when you're doing a operation on a row in the database, there's isolation, meaning that nobody else can can read right into that. Probably read, but probably cannot write into that um, into that row. So it's the same thing that that and this this addresses the problem where if a, a gateway G one in the origin network, you know, network one uh, is is processing the asset, the the transfer across the the current owner, you know, should not be able to manipulate it. In other words, you, you shouldn't the owner should not be able to. You know, assign it to a different user in the same network, for example, right? So it, it needs to be uh, isolation needs to be uh, achieved, and durability. So once a transaction commits, right, there's a point in the flow where where commitment has been reached. It must hold regardless regardless of sus subsequent crashes. So if you have two gateways, and in the in the typical case, one of them crashes after the commit has been reached, the commit point, then it, it, it's as good as done, right? It means it's 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 finished, uh, and so this is one of the challenges that that uh, Raphael has been working on as part of his thesis. He's Raphael is kind of now the the world expert on <laughs> on uh, gateway crashes. If you if you if you're wondering why you gateway crashes all the time, uh, call call him up. Um, and, and this is a, a high level um, diagram, high level summary. Um, the protocol has three stages. Uh, we, we used to call it um, three phases, but the terminology got confused because that this this what you're seeing this here is called a two phase commit. It's actually a three phase commit that we had to trim down. It's accurately called a two and a half two and a half phase commit. So stage one is all the uh, setup phase. We call it setup phase. Here's the here's the asset that's going to be transferred, and then. At the end of this back and forth, there's a you know both sides agree to proceed, and so the last message in stage one is a transfer commence. You know let's let's commence. And this is where this is where we move into stage two, where um, interesting things occur. So the, the first thing that needs to happen is that gateway G one needs to disable the asset, and for convenience we use the word lock, even though we know the word lock has very specific. Intent, so, you know. So sometimes, I would say, disable the asset, uh, but you know, it could be locked, it could be escrowed, many other things. The key thing is how step two is achieved is outside the purview of the ITF and of the working group. The reason being is that there are so many different blockchains today that could be part of Ledger One, that could implement Ledger One, uh, and there's so many ways to implement a gateway that's imp impossible to know in advance. That you're going to be using a lock, you're going to be using a time lock, you're going to, you know, be escrowing to a special node in the blockchain. That's that's almost impossible to predict. And so we can only say disable the asset in step two. And so in step three, uh, the gate the gateway will say it's going to send a signed message, an assertion saying, "I have locked the asset in network one." Right? It's a digitally signed message. It has legal and financial repercussions right it's not just any old message it's it's asserting that that he's done his job gateway one and that if anything goes wrong uh between step two and step three the onus is on gateway one and then in step four uh gateway two will will record this assertion so how how record is implemented it it could be a copy of the assertion being written as data or metadata to the ledger l2 Yep, it could be a message, a broadcast message to all the participants uh, in network two. That's also possible. Again, it's 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 out of the scope for the IETF because it's just too many 
uh, possibilities. And in the, in the future, there'll be new types of blockchains that might have inbuilt capabilities to uh, solve this problem. In step five, gateway two signs, uh, sends a signed receipt message. A receipt means this uh, a signed acknowledgement. Yes, I've received the uh, assertion message, so a hash of the lock assertion message three was is included in step five. And it's asserting that um, the the uh, the the gateway to is is accepting the fact that the asset has been uh, has been locked by gateway one. So that's the summary of stage two. It's effectively, stage two focuses on disabling the asset uh, and for for both gateways to exchange information, exchange sign assertions and receipts to that effect. Now, stage three is when uh, the trigger gets pulled, right? So, so if you understand three-phase commit and three-phase commit, it's designed, the setup, the classic database is designed to set up to the point where uh, one side is ready to pull the trigger. And when you pull the trigger, it's literally milliseconds it should take and, and everything you know, resolves. So in step, step six, there's a commit prepare. So this is gateway one saying to gateway two, hey, I'm going to finalize my disablement. In other words, I'm going to burn the asset in Ledger L1. Uh, be ready to commit. Okay. Now, in uh, uh, step seven, Gateway Two creates the equivalent temporary asset that is assigned to itself. Okay. It's saying, "Hey, here's I've." In other words, uh, Gateway G2 is creating the same asset uh, on Ledger L2. It's assigned to self, meaning that if there is if there's any aborts and rollback, it can always take back the asset because it's under the control of gateway G2. Once that is done, it sign, sends a signed commit ready message, right? So commit prepare and commit ready are standard two-phase two commit protocol uh, messages. And once um, gateway G1 receives message eight, commit ready, it actually does the burn, which is step nine. So how the burn is performed, how the, the extinguishment is performed in step nine is outside the scope for IETF against. It depends on the, the, bear in mind that Ledger L1 could be a database. Remember, this is one of the requirements. So a database may not even have an extinguish operation, right? It could just be a, a delete or, or mark a row in the table. And then and then once that has been uh, done, has been performed, uh, Gateway G1 uh, sends a commit final. Okay, I've, I've done that. Why, why don't you finalize your commit Gateway G2 in your Ledger L2. And so in, in step uh, 11, Ledger L2 actually assigns the asset to the beneficiary. So there's the originator and the beneficiary, you know, Alice and Bob. So, so Bob receives the asset in step 11. And in step 12, Gateway G2 signs a receipt message, signs a message saying, I have allocated, I have transmitted a move the, the self-assigned asset from step seven to Bob in step 11, right? So, so this is a, a signed message that has um, legal and financial implications. And then uh, by the time you reach step 13, it's just, it's just logging, it's done. So basically for all intents and purposes, the protocol you know, finishes at, at step 12. Now we have three draft specifications today. We have the uh, architecture um, document, which is mostly what this is. And then we have uh, the actual protocol flows with the message bodies and so on, and the API definitions. Again, the uh, ITF focuses on message flows and APIs and not the endpoint uh, implementations. We have a third one, which Rama is leading, which is the use cases document. And so uh, we actually have a few more other work items that are pending, but you know the ITF would like people to focus on you know, chunks of work. So this is kind of currently on our plate. Uh, please look at that. If you wanna just uh, look at that um, URL at the bottom. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so why the ITF? So <clears throat> the ITF has been around 40 years at least. Uh, so <clears throat> it's kind of the home of <clears throat> all the uh, internet protocols, TCP, IP, <clears throat> DNA, <clears throat> sorry, uh, DNA, <clears throat> DNS, 
PHP and 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 other code. <clears throat> okay, I think. Um, okay, I think I think I'm good. I don't I don't want to you know keep people here. <clears throat> uh, any questions? I'm monitoring the Zoom chat. No questions so far, but I would like to underline for everyone, please feel free to ask questions. And also, since the live stream was having some trouble, I highly recommend that you ask questions on the Zoom chat. There's a hand up, Peter. Jim, Jim, oh. Jim. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so the, the flow that Thomas just went through, um, between the two gateways on managing the transaction all look good. I haven't looked at the documentation yet on the IA ETF site, but I'll guess that somewhere in the documentation, you're looking at what I call scenarios to extend the simplicity of that model and to I'll call it, uh, add what I call real world complexity for external escrow managers, things like the fact that in a multi-node network on each side, that in effect, we don't require all nodes to be currently finalized at the same time, you know, that they're, that in a sense, the architecture should accommodate all of those things, including failure scenarios. Like, you know, if, if something fails, as you pointed out, at any one of those steps that you showed between the two gateways, that I have automatic, automatic um, recovery on the transaction and the asset, right? So they're in, and the fact that the both nodes are operating in a sense with messages, but they're async, not sync. We can't assume synchronous, you know, completion all the time. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Good. Okay. Uh, awesome. Jim, so you're mo you're much welcome to come and contribute, uh, you know, specs to the idea. <laughs> right. So it's more That's important everything. that I actually go to the site and look at your docs then. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. No, it's, it's, uh, so we, we, we were told we have to finish the three broccolis on our plate before we can do other stuff because because uh what's the famous saying you know engineers like shiny objects right so like you know we're always yeah. like chasing you so so yeah you know uh we have several scenarios i think uh i think we've got a guy who's working on um real world assets and so they, so if you right. have any ideas please feel free to come so, to the itf well so actually uh, yeah i'll and, steal i'll steal an uh, so you said more than once so far that you correctly were what I call taking um, architecture patterns from classic database. And the funny part is I'll say DLT architecture is way behind the sophistication of the solution patterns that exist in classic database, clearly. And you have all of that knowledge. So the nice part is I always say it's like stealing from success in another domain to apply those same winning solution architectures into the DLT domain, which obviously you've been doing that. And so what's strange to me is that the DLT domain has yet to catch up. So when we look at what I call the limitations of DLT, um, it's mostly because they failed to apply a lot of those patterns that you've already are well aware of. So the, I'll call it the opportunity to, you know, say, hit 20, 50, 100 million transactions a second potentially for you know financial stuff or whatever whatever the thing is mobility applications the capability to do that exists but not through the architectures that have been rolled out there for what it's worth you know what i mean so yeah, continuing yeah. your evolution if you will of applying patterns from better domains into the yeah. dlt domain should yield a lot of results for all these issues I'm optimistic. Yeah, no, anyway. that's right. I, I I have no shame in in stealing from famous people like like Jim Jim Gray and uh, you know uh, right. who's the guy who Postgres. Uh, he's 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 at MIT. Um, yeah, these are these guys. These guys are in the eighties, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's it's kind of it's a it's an honor to them that many of their uh, you know um, you know uh, designs and patterns survive you know literally 30 years 40 years into the future well and that actually so you're that's the win is in a sense rather than try to reinvent things is actually to grab the winning patterns that already exist and apply them in a different domain but you're you obviously do that really well so thank you for that no th th thank you jim but 
come and contribute to the IETF. This is, you know, and, and so you could do, so I think the, the what, what I'm seeing both Ram and Raphael doing is doing the formal spec document thing and, and getting beat up in public and so on in the IETF and then doing the implementation in Hyperledger, Cacti or, or similar organizations. Great, thank you so much. Rafael. Thanks, Peter. Um, um, thank you for your comments, Jim. I just uh, wanted to give a word. Um, you said a lot of things that I like and that I relate to. Um, one of them being uh, our inspiration on well-proved, scalable, uh, distributed algorithms to implement our interop solutions. Then the, the difficulty here is that the security, the privacy models, um, and even the performance models of distributed ledgers are, they have some fundamental differences between distributed systems. The, the one being more obvious is there is no single point of control. And these of course create, so although we use and we are inspired on uh, proved work, we have a new set of constraints and different models. So it's not trivial to do integration. However, we could still reutilize a lot of what has been done before and now taking into account the new models. Uh, so for example, we, um, we have to, let's say, instantiate the rollback model to be compatible with the blockchain because most blockchains do not allow rollbacks by design. So we studied this, we've um, created models, we've created the specs, but now we come into the implementation realm and this is where things start to be interesting because uh, one thing is the theory and the specs and the other thing is the whole array of implementations you can explore. So we have two implementations, one that is uh, written uh, in Rust led by Raman's colleagues, another one in uh, TypeScript. And it's curious, we explore a different array of, um, of techniques, for example, to lock the assets, uh, to unlock the assets. We have the burn int model, we have the escrows. So I believe in order to, to have the protocol useful in practice, there needs to be uh, a lot of companies, a lot of uh, different organizations to come in and design some of the pieces. We cannot design everything. Uh, we're mostly focused on the core protocol. But as we'll talk a bit later in this webinar, we've already started uh, implementing, well, already for around two years now, but but still we mainly focus on the core, but we also need to do some pieces on the side, otherwise the implementation will will not be able to provide even for a demo. So thank you for your comments. Thank you, Rafael. We also have another question on the chat from Ravinder. For the previous diagram shared by Thomas, does the request initiated independently for G1 and G2 for assertion of assets and further same for stage one, stage two, et cetera? How can we manage the latency for requests over the network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so what's not shown there is what, what we call fondly stage zero which is the setup, right? This is, there's a, this is gonna be the next set of specs, which is how do you set this up before we can even enter you know, SAP B protocol. And, and one of the uh, things that needs to be communica communicated between G1 and G2 in the setup phase, stage zero, is what is, how much time does both ledgers take to uh, finalize? Right? Does it take five milliseconds? Does it take 60 seconds? Why is that important? It's because then G1 and G2 can uh, adjust their clocks uh, so that um, they, they can they can anticipate, you know, why, you know, why is G1 so slow? Because G1 has already told you it takes, it takes 60 seconds to finally burn, you know, to do a final burn of an asset. So this is one of the parameters that need to be exchanged. Uh, also what's not uh, shown there is Part of the setup phase is we have to verify the identity of the gateway owners. Uh, we have to verify the identity of the originated beneficiary, or this is all outside the scope of, of our work. We have to uh, figure out, uh, so some people are saying, well, should you check the 
the legality of the uh, asset is ju in jurisdiction J2. So if an asset is not recognized in a jurisdiction J2, jurisdiction two, right? So, so gateway G2 needs to communicate this back saying, according to, you know, to my setup, my policy configuration, uh, as, uh, we, we only accept, you know, the following asset classes, A, B, C, D, E, okay? And, and I can't find a mat match for your asset in network one, right? So, so we, we can't proceed, right? Now this triggers a whole discussion about, well, uh, right now, the the financial world recognizes um, asset classes, the traditional asset classes such as commodities like wheat and gold and so on, and and paper notes and so on. But there's a whole new generation of what is called tokenized real world assets that people want to begin trading. It could be anything from real estate to you know my favorite examples is the Picasso in my basement, which is genu genuine, genuine, one hundred percent you know genuine. You know, so this this brings it, and and I think uh, the one of the great things about this whole Web three and blockchain sort of narrative for the last ten years, it's 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 opening up the various possibilities for the future, and at the same time, it's asking us, the engineers, to fix these because in many scenarios, nothing has been written down. There's no infrastructure to do this, right? So this is, but that that's a that's a great that's a great question. This is this is uh, we, we always kind of get worried when we say stage zero because we know the the amount of work that needs to be done in in stage zero uh, and so to to answer your specific question so the initiation typically occurs um the originator says i want to transfer an asset to bob in network 2 right so this uh, the, the proper scenario is that there's an application running in stage two between Alice and Bob. And, and Alice says, hey, Bob, I'm going to transfer this asset to you. And this is application to application out of band. And then once Bob says yes, then Alice will trigger SATP and Gateway 1. And Bob will basically trigger Gateway 2, say, you know, be ready to receive this asset coming in. So that's part of the setup of stage zero. But 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 once that happens... SATP should run to completion. I, I don't know if I don't know if that kind of helps, Ravinder. Yep, he said thank you for the explanation. Got it. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Any more questions before we move on to my quick section about introducing Hyperledger, Hyperledger Cacti, and also talk about the X factor of the IETF and the foundation. No, okay. So then, oh wait, one more. Yes, no more questions. Let me share screen. Uh, all right, so can you see my screen? Okay. So the Hyperledger Foundation is a collection of projects and uh, it's been around since 2015. It is all about enterprise blockchain and uh, I work for a different company called Accenture, but uh, I also maintain as my main responsibility this project called Hyperledger Cacti, which is uh, the enterprise grade framework for blockchain interoperability. And the way we put this event together today is to demonstrate and show the combination of the IETF and Hyperledger Cacti coming together to provide not just the standards and the theoreticals behind uh, the interop, but also we want to showcase that there's implementation behind it. So the two together 
is more powerful because you always have a lot of different standards competing, but uh, it all comes down to the pair of standards and the implementation that is being used. Usually that's the winner. I think there's a, there's a meme about this somewhere about uh, 14 competing standards and then someone trying to fix all of them and now there's 15 competing standards. So we're trying to avoid that by having reference implementations at the same time so that uh, people can read what the standard is about. They can read uh, the papers, they can read the architecture and then go ahead and try it out. <clears throat> so we will have Rafael and Rama present. Actually, Rama will present first because uh, it's very late in his time zone. So he might uh, uh, have to tap out a little closer to the end. And uh, both of them will showcase the implementation section of what Thomas just talked about from the standard body perspective. And uh, with that said, I would like to pass it on to Rama. Rama, are you ready with your slides? Yes, let me share the screen. Okay, is your screen right? Yep, I'll take that as a yes. All right, so uh, I'm going to just give a brief overview of, uh, a brief preamble, not an overview, preamble of uh, what you need to understand before I talk about the components that are being uh, used and augmented for a SAPI implementation, and also before showing the actual SAPI implementation demonstration. Uh, uh, many of you, if you have seen uh, previous presentations on uh, Cacti and on the uh, on the Beaver system that I used to be part of earlier, then this might be uh, might not be new to you, but just bear with me. So uh, broadly, we uh, we all sort of I think uh, come to a consensus that we can classify various kinds of interoperability modes into into three main classes, and uh, you'll see uh, we mentioned this in the main uh, SATP architecture draft as well. If you go and uh, take a look at that, uh, you have two different systems okay they can be networks uh, like thomas said uh, we are not restricting our endpoints to being just blockchains or distributed ledgers they can be uh, your classic centralized uh, uh, system backed by a database too but whatever those systems may be what do they want to do with each other if you get two systems they want to broadly do three things one of three things they want to transfer an asset uh, they want to be able to exchange an asset across each other that is there's a distinct from the first case because here in the second case assets don't actually leave their network boundaries but uh it has to be an all or nothing just like an asset transfer you have to have the assets being exchanged in both at both ends or it has to revert back to the origin stream. and then there is a, a a mode where you just want different ledgers to be able to share information with each other why would they want to do that because uh, a lot of these uh, networks especially if you're talking about private blockchain networks they are handling a, as we have seen in the real world, they handle a very limited portion of some kind of a real world uh, workflow. Let's say uh, we're thinking about the world of supply chain. You can have one network managing just uh, uh, the currency payments, another network managing just the financing of the trade agreement, another network managing just the logistics part of the shipping. So these networks manage particular part of the workflows, but then it doesn't make sense for them to depend on centralize the third party mediators to then communicate data to each other. What you need is a way for them to be able to share their states and also provide some kind of authenticity, authenticity proof, uh, showing that any information that reaches a particular network uh, is based on the consensus output or the finality reached by the sending network. So that's really what data sharing is about. So you have uh, two kinds of atomic transactions and one kind of uh, proof-based uh, data communication. Uh, in a very theoretical sense, we can classify this broadly into 
two kinds of cross network dependencies. As you see here, there's a bidirectional dependency in which all asset transfers and exchange, and the unidirectional dependency uh, where the data sharing falls into. So bidirectional means that uh, you have a, a write or uh, some kind of a, uh, an update in two different ledgers affecting each other. Whereas you have in, in the data sharing or data transfer, you have uh, some state change in one ledger triggering a uh, write or state change in a, in a different ledger. Uh, it's not a strict uh, write to write or a, or a, or a bidirectional dependency there. So almost all cross network process interdependencies, we believe can be realized as a combination of these three classes. Now, uh, when you're designing these systems, uh, and uh, this is true for cacti, uh, we, we, we thought of particular design principles. So very loosely speaking, you can work an interoperability system, but it's, uh, it's something that connects two separate ledgers or two separate uh, networks and enables them to interoperate with each other. Can be built, you know, there are many, many different kinds of designs you can have, uh, but where we wanted to, uh, do uh, how we wanted to build the system was according to particular set of design principles, which involve uh, not relying on trusted external intermediaries, keeping the networks independent, ensuring that privacy is uh, maintained by design, leveraging the native consensus uh, algorithms of the different systems, and uh, not being biased towards any particular distributed ledger technology. So we want uh, to build solutions which will work Regardless of whether you're using, uh, you, you're trying to make two fabric networks interoperate, or you're trying to make an Ethereum network interoperate with the Corda network, or what have you. So uh, that brings us to how we envision Cacti. So Cacti is a general purpose, modular, and pluggable interoperability framework. And it is envisioned to link networks that are built on uh, heterogeneous DLTs, which means uh, any different kind of DLTs. We are not concerned about what's happening inside the DLTs, we're just focusing on providing a solution for those DLTs to interoperate with each other. As you can see here, this is sort of a triangle. The triangle, the size of the triangle reflect the three kind of interoperability modes I talked about, asset transfer, data sharing, asset exchange. Uh, you can ignore the other part, there's, there's a role for decentralized identity here, but we don't want to go into that right now. Uh, and uh, what we have is uh, uh, we, we can enable this sort of interaction between uh, or across different networks using particular components that are provided by CACTI. One of them is called a node server, and another is called a relay. And uh, why do you have two kinds of these? So that's, I, I want to just give a brief overview before uh, we go into uh, implementation, uh, because that will help you uh, navigate through the code repository and, and uh, understand the instructions and then test it out and uh, you know augment it as, as you see fit. Otherwise, uh, uh, if you, if any naive user goes to the repository, you know, there are a bunch of different readmes, there are a bunch of documents, you might even get confused. So I want to just give a brief history of how this architecture came about, how this vision came about, and uh, what uh, are the different options that you can get uh, in, in CACTI. So I'll come to the node server relay part, just uh, consider that there are different ways by which we can enable within CACTI these sort of uh, use cases, use cases for sharing data, for exchanging assets, for transferring assets. Uh, so, uh, in effect, what you want to enable through Cacti, to so also Cacti-based solution, is an internet of blockchains, which is completely decentralized. So what we don't want is, uh, we explicitly did not want to provide yet another third-party blockchain that provides the backing for uh, two networks to do their settlement. That, that people had built solutions like that before. We especially wanted, we specifically wanted to achieve those kinds of solutions. Uh, what Cacti offers right now, it gives you modular code, gives you scenarios that are composable that you can build end-to-end -end pipelines for to realize these use cases and gives you plugin-based architecture. The components you can download and import directly uh, uh, from uh, uh, from NPM or GitHub or Docker, or you can build them locally from the source by cloning their repository. So uh, that brings me to uh, some specific things I want to mention before going to the implementation. Now, uh, Peter mentioned that both uh, Rafael and I have, are going to talk about implementation. So why are we talking about two separate implementation? Because the history of this project is such that this the project called Cacti uh, was uh, uh, built by merging what used to be uh, the Beaver Lab project uh, less than two years ago uh, with Hyperledge Cactus, which was a pre-existing Hyperledge project. So both of these projects uh, had uh, the similar design philosophy, then they followed the same design principles I showed you 
couple of slides ago. And uh, we felt that it was just a natural fit for us to, uh, you know, because we're trying to provide an interoperability solution. And it doesn't, uh, if you want to solve the fragmentation problem on, on blockchains, it just doesn't make sense to have the even interoperability solution space be fragmented. So it's really, this is the, uh, the by having different kind of interoperability mechanisms and modes, we worked on under a common interoperability platform is really the best way we can enable that what we do will have an impact in the real world and will we'll get used. So what we did and uh, was we decided to merge these two projects and create Hyperage Cacti at the end of uh, November, at the end of 2022. And you can see an article this is linked to on the readme. Uh, so what we ended up doing was we uh, merged two pre-existing GitHub repositories into one. So we had Hyperage Cactus and then we had the Weaver Lab repository. So we ended up because we wanted to import the history as well, we uh, copied the entire Beaver repository code into a folder named Beaver. So if you go to the, if you navigate to the Cacti uh, GitHub repository, if you see the folder called Beaver and you go inside that, there, there you'll find all the components uh, that uh, are inherited into Cacti from the Beaver system. Uh, whereas here, anything else is inherited from the pre-existing Hyperage Cactus system. So I hope that can that that clears up any confusion people might have. Anybody, if you went to the repository and you got confused, okay. Uh, so what we also done uh, over the since the integration or the merge was announced was we uh, we created the common documentation. Uh, we, uh, we published all the packages and the Docker images etc. under a common Cacti namespace and we integrated all the the CI CD, all the testing framework. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, Cacti is now a uh, not just a uh, graduated Hyperledger project, it's also the flagship interoperability project under uh, under Hyperledger. And we hope going forward in the future, what we, uh, uh, the kind of merge that we did in order to consolidate interoperability efforts and avoid reinventing the wheel will be replicated even further. Maybe, you know, other frameworks in the, in the future will also choose to join us and contribute and build, make a bigger family of, uh, uh, mechanisms uh, under the character umbrella. Uh, okay, so uh, a few things still left to be done, uh, and I'm not sure how much time I have. Uh, Peter, how are you doing in time? I think you're okay, right? We are doing very good on time. We haven't even passed the first hour mark, so awesome. please take as much time as you need. We have plenty. Sure. And yeah, if anybody has a burning question and if you're confused about anything I'm saying, just, just butt in. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what remains to be done? Now, uh, these are these were two, you know, the older character projects were two full-fledged software projects that have been worked on for multiple years before they got merged. So naturally, you know, it's 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 not easy to integrate everything in one go. So as of this point, the cactus and the view packages, as well as the pipelines uh, or the of use cases they support, still remain distinct within the uh, cacti repository. And if you go to the official documentation, there also you will see two separate document uh, starting landing points for the cactus and the beaver uh, examples. That uh, for now that's the case because uh, we have only so much bandwidth and we have a lot on our hands. So. Um, we have been uh, busy building various features, tightening different uh, uh, co components and so on. But one thing we are going to do this year, and I'll just jump to that, that particular uh, uh, bullet here, we are going to build a common set of core operators uh, uh, as part of a mentorship project that's been announced and we're in the process of selecting a suitable candidate for that. Uh, once we build that, we're going to be integrating the full system uh, into uh, 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 something that is uh, that offers one uh, uh, easy to understand and meaningful platform uh, with with different uh, families of uh, mechanisms from which you can borrow what you need in order to fulfill a particular use case. Uh, so we do need to do some source code refactoring. Uh, uh, some of these are uh, easy to do, and we will be doing them. Uh, many of these tasks sometimes this year. We're going to be creating new facet of packages. Uh, package plugins uh, offered in a mono repo, uh, which is how if you go to the Cacti repository, you will see a folder called uh, packages. And there you have uh, a set of packages that offer various different things. And uh, uh, when you end up, when you build a pipeline, you're supposed to select from those packages and uh, suitably, and uh, that allows you to uh, carry out a transaction between two different networks, for example. 
So uh, what we need to do is we need to import all the Beaver packages or the Beaver modules also into uh, into, into those packages. And that, that's something that's relatively easy to do. Uh, some of these are a little more challenging to do, uh, like the core operative module, which I just mentioned. That's why we have a, an, a mentorship project for that. We'll be working with somebody for, I guess, most of the rest of the year to get that done. Uh, there's some terminology I want to clear up. Uh, in, in cactus parlance, there's a uh, there's something called connectors or connectors are whatever uh, are, are uh, library functions that are needed in order to uh, access a particular ledger. Now, uh, uh, there's a particular way by which uh, you, know, you pick a particular programming language, let's say uh, JavaScript, then you will be importing particular libraries and you'll be instantiating a gateway to connect to fabric network and then querying the network, or querying the ledger, or submitting a transaction to the ledger. Uh, you do something conceptually very similar, say if you're, uh, if you pick a Beru network, or if you pick a, a Corda network, what you do in concept is very similar, but what the software that you need in order to do those things are very different. So these uh, a connector is something that you build once and you can reuse for any kind of network that you need to help uh, interoperate uh, time and again. So you build uh, a, a fabric connector that will help you uh, drive transactions across any fabric network. Now in Weaver, because it was a project that had its own separate evolution, we called the same kind of functions as drivers. So just keep that in mind. If you go into the project and if you're looking at, uh, if you're confused by what these terms mean, and uh, uh, if you are, uh, 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 if you identify, if you're smart and you identify that connectors and drivers do so pretty much the same function, you'd be right. So uh, what in Beaver I will call driver in, in later later in this presentation is basically the same thing as a connector. And uh, when we do a deeper integration, our goal is to merge these into a common component, thereby eliminating uh, redundancies among the different modules. Uh, we also want to offer a common SDK and client API, of course, uh, one for different programming languages. So you can imagine one in JavaScript, one in uh, Java or Kotlin, one Golang and so on. Uh, and uh, we want to offer a uh, factory of pipelines offering selection of different modes for end-to-end uh, -end transactions uh, through the integrated cafe system. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that we do need to update the white paper. Uh, if you've seen the repository recently, older white paper is deprecated, but given our new outlook and the new architecture, we want to write a new one. So, I'm not going to explain this architecture. You see this also in the uh, readme page, I think of the, uh, or, or the roadmap page in the character repository, but this is what we envision the integrated architecture to look like. And the core, ob core operator module is basically this uh, at the bottom right. And the uh, connection of connectors or drivers is, is this. And there's an API here and so on. Uh, you can also see a node server, which is the, the component that enables orchestration of transactions across different networks is the component that uh, Cacti inherits from Cactus. And the component called Relay is uh, something that Cact uh, Cacti, Cacti inherits from uh, from the Weaver Lab project. And I'm going to talk, talk about the Relay because that's the implementation. It, it's on the using the Relay that uh, uh, we have implemented uh, one version of, of SACP. Uh, later on, Rafael is going to talk about the different kinds of implementation, not using these. So, just imagine uh, the possibilities here. So let's say you have two different networks. You have a fabric network and you have a Bezo network. Okay, uh, of course they can both be fabric networks so they can be networks of running on any other kind of stack. Uh, what you can do is uh, on those networks, you can build, uh, you, you can deploy a particular uh, validating contracts and you can also deploy connectors above that. And then uh, let's say your applications running uh, on those two networks. Now those applications can trigger any kind of process of transaction uh, in, uh, in, in different ways. One, it can uh, trigger transactions through relays. You can see here the, the blue line. So you can imagine a pipeline going from the ledger up the blue through the relays and down here. So that is kind of an end-to-end -end pipeline. And that's one way of uh, uh, doing cross-network communication as well as transaction orchestration. Now, if you look at the node server, uh, it's it's something that allows you to uh, deploy uh, customized business logic as plugin. And 
using Node Circle, you can uh, uh, you can run orchestrated transactions between two different ledgers, and you can do that with, with various levels of centralization, depending on what kind of logic you're, you're putting in there. So broadly speaking, uh, if you want to do any kind of cross-network communication in order to fulfill transactions across two different ledgers, you have a choice. And that's really, uh, those are the two different kinds of SAP implementations they're going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about a SAP implementation via the blue path, and uh, Rafa is going to be talking about it using uh, a, a plugin uh, uh, that, that he's written uh, for, uh, uh, for implementing it. Okay, so uh, again, uh, continuing the primer a little bit, and now I'm going to just go over to the the Weaver component because that's the that's where the SAP implementation that we have done uh, uh, lies. So in concept, what we uh, envisioned was that if you have any two different networks built on any kind of ledger technology, uh, these networks can either have or they can uh, uh, acquire services of some uh, component called a relay and the two networks then will be able to communicate via this relay. So the, the guiding concept that we thought we should institute were that uh, a network should be able to make claims to each other and also be able to supply proofs. So effectively we want states to be communicated across networks and we want the networks to also be able to validate those proofs based on uh, whatever policies that they have. So it's not like one network should be trusting something the uh, another network or its relay says. It can it needs to have a way to validate that. So there are uh, states uh, which a section of the state can be uh, transmitted to a different network as a claim. You also have to select proof and the receiver receiving network using its own consensus protocol will then validate that proof using as per that network's acceptance policy. That in a in a nutshell is uh, what. Uh, this the sort of uh, uh, architecture allows. And as we'll see later, this is very much amenable to how uh, the SAPI protocol that Thomas is describing uh, is. So there are things that we need the core networks to support, things like the ability to lock assets, be able to generate ledger state proofs, to do asset control and so on. Or uh, what is relevant to asset transfer, they ought to be able to burn assets, they ought to be able to mint assets. Uh, and, and also lots of things. Now, the, the relay components we envision are uh, act as communicators. So if you, if you can uh, uh, analogize with this with the internet, think of uh, uh, the uh, interconnectivity nodes like routers or DNS uh, node, anything that allows uh, one system to be able to discover another system and then be able to communicate with it. The, our, our relays are meant to be a, a sort of an extensible module that enables all of that, any sort of intermediation with the outside world, yet without making the relay be a trusted third party. Okay, now, and that's very important. Uh, so we can enable protocols like data share for data sharing, asset transfer, and asset exchange using this these set of capabilities. The relays are able to, uh, okay, I did not mention the concept of views. Uh, views are just uh, the term we use, it's, we borrowed from database. It's just a way for one network to query data from another network and for that network to provide the data. It's, it's sort of like uh, providing a view to some part of its, its state. And the view also carries with its state proof. Uh, also, the envision the relays uh, can be able to invoke contracts across each other, be able to uh, publish and subscribe for events and so on. Uh, don't skip the system architecture here in the time. Uh, or actually, no. Let me just uh, quickly mention what's here. So, in the in the in the in the weaver part of the cacti uh, system, we have these particular components. So, our relays are really modules which uh, can be classified into two parts or, or divided into two parts. One is what we call just the relay, and another what we call a set of drivers, which are nothing but plugins. Uh, so, drivers are uh, plugins or uh, or connectors that can be used to drive transactions through a particular uh, DLT type. The relay is designed to be completely DLT agnostic. It is it is meant to enable cross network discovery and messaging. Uh, a driver is something that can plug into a, a, a general purpose relay for use in a particular kind of network. So if you want a, a relay to be able to work with a given fabric network, you will plug in a fabric driver. If you want to relay to uh, work with your Corda network, you'll plug in a Corda driver. And again, uh, reminding you, driver is basically the same thing as a connector. Uh, 
within the networks, we have particular core network capabilities. Uh, this is what we call uh, core operators. Uh, these, are, these are built and deployed in the form of uh, contract. In Fabric, this will be deployed in the form of chain code, and they will do the functions of locking assets, burning assets, minting assets, uh, generating state code, and so on. And then we have application SDKs. We also have a uh, component for doing distributed decentralized ident identity management, which you won't go into right now. So uh, how does uh, this look like if you actually want to use the solution in a in a given network? So imagine a, a typical Hyperledger like Fabric network, kind of simplified version of that. You have peers, orders, CAs, you have chain code, and then you have a client application over that, right? So uh, what you will do is, as part of the infrastructure, you are going to be deploying relays and you're going to be plugging in drivers. Now, why the drivers up in the client? Some kind of wallet ID in order to drive transactions through the network. That's why it's it's marked here. But otherwise, the drivers uh, from a system uh, wiring perspective, they are sort of uh, meant to be coupled, maybe loosely with the with the relay. And then you can in applications you can uh, import uh, uh, particular uh, SDK libraries that we offer from uh, within Cacti Weaver. And uh, uh, we, we also offer a, a standard chain code that offers core functions of locking assets, generating state proofs, burning, minting, and so on, uh, which you will deploy on your traffic nodes. Something very simple in Corda. Again, if you understand the Corda architecture, you have uh, the node at the bottom, then you have a two layer Corda, which consists of contracts. Above that lies uh, workflows, and then you can build client applications over. So, uh, very similar to fabric uh, architecture. Uh, again, within Cacti Weaver, we offer the same relays. We offer now Corda drivers, and we offer Corda client SDKs and a standard Corda app that must be installed on the nodes of your Corda network. So this is you can see the logic here. You uh, there are particular uh, components that are going to be DLT agnostic, which you can add to infrastructure. Particular components which you will need to deploy, like these contracts or the DApps and the drivers, and then there are particular components that you will need to import in your application in order to exercise the capabilities, capabilities that help you orchestrate or trigger transactions between two different networks. Um, in Fabric, uh, this is the relays can be deployed in uh, in different modes, as you can see here. Uh, it it doesn't honestly it doesn't actually matter because the relays are not trusted for either. Inte integrity or confidentiality, they are trusted to some extent for availability because you need a relay to be available and to communicate information between any two different networks. But other than that, because you don't trust it for confidentiality or integrity, you can actually deploy it as a, you, you, or, or rather a relay can be uh, owned by a single organization. That is, it, it obtains a wallet entity in, this, in the left diagram from org A or if you can uh, say it has a wallet identity from the ordering service uh, organization, or it has its own separate organization and it has wallet ID. Honestly, it doesn't matter because finally the decisions at the back, the way we envisioned it, uh, whenever you have to actually make any commitments, they are being made by the networks using consensus. And the network is not simply just trusting the relay. They are trusting proof, so they're trusting evidence that the networks can independently verify and come to a consensus on. Uh, okay. I just Stop the briefly to see if there are any questions because I, I know I've talked a lot and then I'll uh, jump to the next part. I'm monitoring the chat and sure. the hands raised and there seems to be no questions so far, but I would also like to call everyone out. If you have a question about what Rama is presenting just now, feel free to pop it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'll just spend a few minutes on this. Uh, so I'm, 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 by the way, I'm talking about this. This is the data sharing. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned about the three different kind of modes at the beginning: data sharing, asset transfer, asset exchange. So why am I talking about data sharing here? It is to show you exactly how uh, the relays and the drivers operate in two different fabric networks in order to enable a cross-network transaction. And that will help uh, you understand then later how we're able to then refashion the relay in order to run SACP. Okay, So uh, you can think of, this is sort of a very simplified version of a, a fabric network. If you're familiar with fabric, 
you know, that's like a, uh, you, you have a peer network with different organizations, you have different channels, you have different uh, chain codes, and then you have different client apps. Uh, and uh, the membership manager denotes the, the CAs uh, or the MSPs. So here, when you call it the system contract, what we are saying is that we are deploying the Beaver Cacti chain code in on the uh, peers of your of the channel from which you want to be able to share data or into which you want to be able to consume data from a different network. Okay, just sticking to the data sharing use case for now. So what do you have here? You, you have mirror images of two fabric networks, and the borders of the networks lie the relays. Backing the relays lie the drivers. These are fabric drivers, by the way, in this case, and the relays can interact with each other using a standard communication protocol, and they can interact with their network via the drivers uh, uh, using uh, other API that you find. Now, what's happening here is uh, in uh, uh, an application, if some, uh, a client application needs to first send a trigger to a relay, to its own relay. So that's step one. You get a request for a data. Now, let me, yeah, let me just give you a quick example of this. So uh, I mentioned the concept of views. So think about this. Now we, we created something called a view address. What that means is that one network, if it wishes to consume some state that lies in a different network, it will create what is called a view address, which looks something like a URL, as you can see here. And then it will communicate that view address via the relay to the, uh, uh, to the network on the right, and the network on the right will then uh, respond with a view. What does the view contain? View contains the answer that the requester is seeking, along with proof of authenticity of that information as uh, being part of this network's ledger. So, in this case, you can probably understand why we're going with this. So, a view address here is. Uh, consists of a, we are telling uh, the relay how to reach a destination relay. So we are saying uh, via this particular relay, go to this particular network and we just have a, uh, we just imagining there's a global namespace of network ID. Okay, now that's not the case today, but uh, you know, if you give Thomas a bit more time, he'll explain how uh, we, we are trying to uh, create a uh, 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 figure out the, the naming for DLT networks as well later on. Uh, but uh, once you reach the relay and then you identify the network beyond the relay, you need to be able to run a query. How do you run a query? On a solid network, you identify a channel. Then you identify a chain code ID. Then you identify a function and you provide per paths. Okay. So it's pretty much as simple as that, at least when it comes to fabric networks. So uh, this way, uh, an application is able to trigger a a request by supplying this kind of query and it via the relays to this network. This network using its the uh, the Cacti Beaver contracts already deployed here decides whether or not this request can be satisfied. So that's some access control also going on there. And then it uh, uh, responds with information. Optionally, this information by the way we can also encrypt. So there's we have a protocol. If you read in the in the, in the Cacti specs, you'll find this protocol whereby we can do end-to-end uh, -end encryptions. Why is that important? As I mentioned uh, just a couple of times ago, we do not want to trust the relay for either integrity or for confidentiality. Why don't we want to trust confidentiality? Because if you are doing access control for these kinds of queries, then uh, if you happen to have malicious relay, which gets the answer that somebody is seeking, it can obviously exploit that to some other, other network, right? Not just this network that is asking the question. And we don't want that. So uh, encryption is, and we believe we are going to be more important uh, going forward, but for uh, we, we did have the uh, encryption uh, 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 institutional protocol whereby data can be encrypted across the different relays. So long story short, the data goes back to the application. The application then submits that uh, decrypted data to the is chain code. Now the application can decrypt the data, but that doesn't mean that the application can tamper with the data because the proof that it needs to submit to its network's chain code uh, has to be validated by those peers and they won't be validated if the application tampers with that. Okay. So uh, finally, the chain code, which is supposed to be consuming the 
return value of, of this particular function to its consensus after validating the proof associated with the uh, with the with this answer is able to do uh, uh, record something on its ledger or let's say it happens a block the chain or something. So this is a an end to end pipeline for doing data sharing. So you can what I want to highlight here is that uh, you can you can do something very complex between two different networks while using the relays while uh, using their own relays without using any kind of shared separate infrastructure any kind of separate trusted third party uh, for the kind of standardized communication and also uh, prevent the relays from uh, acting uh, maliciously. So having said that, I can move to the sappy part of this, uh, this, this presentation. So again, I'll stop briefly to see if anybody has questions. There is one question yeah. on the chat from uh, Arbinov. I want to ask how the relay is being implemented, as in Raul mentioned about availability relay. So should I consider it some kind of container being ran on Docker Swarm or Kubernetes? There's some certain number of replicas, or is it something totally different? Uh, yeah, uh, th those are good questions for a uh, production deployment. Now, if you uh, we uh, do not have an out of the box solution for a uh, building a redundancy in relays or providing highly available relay, but uh, it's not something that uh, we. It's something that you can already do if you already if you're already aware of uh, how to build high availability systems, building redundant systems. Uh, you can actually replicate multiple relays, uh, use them in a configure them for a single network, and have them uh, act on this. So instead of one relay that is shown here, you can actually configure more than one relay. Uh, thing is, if you go to the cacti, uh, the bigger part of it, you you don't have a an out of box example there. You know, maybe someday we'll we can we can have such an example. Uh, you know, if any of you is interested in uh, uh, working on such an example, it's you won't have to basically change any code. You just have to go and uh, create some new configurations and then just run an end-to-end uh, -end, uh, pipeline and and configure a, a test for that. So yeah, it can be done, but we don't have a, a an example out of the box within the tech code. So hope that answers the question. I'll take that as yes, but uh, you know, if you uh, after I finish the presentation, maybe you can uh, I can respond in chat if somebody wishes to talk further about that. So uh, implementation of SATP in Happy Ninja Cacti. So going back to this diagram I showed earlier about the network of network vision that uh, we are do we are enabling with Cacti, we are trying to solve the asset transfer problem using relay modules between two different networks. Uh, now this shows Corda, but that's just an example. What we are going to be what I'm going to be demonstrating right now is. Uh, uh, it is uh, 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 between two fabric networks. So uh, this implementation was worked on as part of a hyperledger mentorship project last year. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to augment the relay according to the uh, SATP draft specs that uh, Thomas gave an overview of, of earlier. And uh, we wanted to implement the SATP standard service endpoints and SATP message passing capabilities in the pre-existing relay module. And we also wanted to add error handling and crash recovery support. That's something that uh, Rafael is going to be talking about uh, in more detail. Uh, it was uh, Zakwan was the one, was a mentee who implemented this. And uh, a big shout out to uh, Rafael and uh, especially Sandeep for uh, spearheading the, uh, the interactions with the, with the mentee and getting this, this, this work done. So I know Sandeep is also one of the maintainers of Cacti and I know he's He's on the on the meeting, so shout out to him. Uh, so the relay, as I've already mentioned earlier, it's a configurable module. Uh, what I don't mention is that as it's implemented, it's it runs uh, it's basically a GRP server, and it's uh, it runs GRP services built on Rust. So the relay is actually the only part of uh, the code uh, the the bigger uh, part of the code base which is built on Rust. Other modules are built using uh, you know, JavaScript or uh, Go or or Java. Uh, this relay is not built for any specific DLT. It's meant to be compatible with, with any. And that's what, as I mentioned earlier, it does fit the specification for an SATP gateway whose sole purpose is to hide the complexity of the network to uh, the external world, yet be able to act on behalf of that, uh, of that network. So 
the Cacti relay architecture, you know, we have a more complex version of this if you go to the RFCs here. But the simplified version, you have the uh, relay that is supporting multiple protocols and different message types. It has a message cache uh, configuration, so on. And you can plug in different drivers. So uh, these are, uh, uh, like I said, connectors. You can build one for fabric, one for cord, and so on. And uh, each of these will connect to a particular DLT network that needs a driver of that particular type. Uh, yeah. So the end to end, I already showed you how uh, an example of how a data sharing happens. Uh, we can do the same thing if you have a relay, uh, you have relay a pair of relays interfacing with each other for on behalf of their respective networks. But now instead of doing data sharing, they be doing asset transfer. So uh, again, covering the same diagram. Uh, actually, let me just quickly go to the. Yeah. Just going to quickly do a skim through of this. So this is the full spec version of the uh, SAP workflow that Thomas talked about earlier. It has many more steps than Thomas mentioned, but uh, uh, they basically he, he covered all of the essential functions that it does. You can see here it starts from uh, step one point one and it goes up to uh, step uh, three point. 3.9. The, the yellow is actually the, only the part between the gateways is what we're trying to standardize and specify in the SAP drafts right now. Uh, there are yellow parts on the left, but it's it, it's something that uh, how exactly you interface with this component is not exactly defined at this point, uh, this way or, or or this way. So for that, we, uh, we were free to use our own imaginations. So what, what's going on here in, uh, in the system that I described, we have Two gateways implemented on our relays, and then this component is basically the uh, you can think of it as either the driver or the uh, or the chain code behind the driver running on the network. So what will happen? Say for example, if you take step two point three a, uh, at this point, this the the gateway on the left, gateway G one, is telling its network to perform a lock, and then it checks to see whether the lock happened. If it does, it tells the other gateway. Lock happened at my end. Now you go and tell your network. So, so that now you are ready to go and mint a new asset. Okay. That's basically what's happening here. So I just want to show this, uh, show this diagram here, uh, as, uh, because I'll be referring to that back in the, uh, yeah, demo slide. So that P basically covers just, just this part. So for, to actually do an end-to-end -end implementation though, you do need uh, more, you do need the, uh, the relay through its drivers to drive a transaction into the network. So for that, we, we just did, we used ad hoc uh, methods. Uh, but what's happening internally within the network, on the left side network, what's happening is uh, uh, at some point there's a lock happening, corresponding to step 213, then extinguishing of an asset eventually after the asset has been minted in the foreign network. And uh, uh, the fact that the transaction, the succeeded is being broadcast to, to the network. Again, uh, correspondingly on the right side. So on the left side, what you have to do, you have to do a lock and burn. On the right side, what you have to do, you have to do a, a, a mint and an assign. So uh, the gateway tells the its network, a lock has been done by the first network. Uh, now you can go and create an asset and later on you're ready to assign an asset. So this is like the two and a half phase protocol as, as Thomas was mentioning. And then in the middle, you have all the other steps that I showed in that uh, long flow diagram, starting from uh, the gateways trading claims to indicating that the the end-to-end -end transaction or the asset transfer have fully completed uh, in a way that is final. So uh, we augmented various character components for therapy for this. So the character relay, as I mentioned, it is based on Rust, runs GRP services and clients, and uh, we added a new service to that. And we also created uh, some service endpoints in the fabric driver in order for the relay to be able to tell the fabric driver, go on, go submit a lock transaction, say, go and do a mint, go and do an assign and so on. It's it's to receive SAP instructions from the relay. This part is not uh, there in the specs yet, but uh, uh, you know we, we, we were able to do it using pre-existing mechanisms that, that we already had for uh, 
uh, how a driver and the relay communicate with each other. We also have to create new data structures. Um, you, you can see this in the uh, in, in the code, and we had a uh, we added a few functions at the at the API level for uh, uh, triggering particular uh, uh, transactions like locking, signing, extinguishing, and so on. Okay. Uh, before this, let me just do. Uh, now I'm going to do a quick demo. Okay. So one second before we get yeah. onto that, I have two yeah. questions from the chat. Please. Uh, Jennifer asks, why does the view address follow a colon format instead of HTTP CRUD? Yeah, it's not a, it's not technically a URL. So it's something that has to be interpreted by a gateway and a gateway is not a, uh, and really a, a, a web service endpoint. You know, it's a, it's a, a gateway is, uh, there's a particular hierarchy according to which we can view networks. You know, you have uh, the relay, which is a way by which to enter the network, hence being perfect fit uh, as a gateway. And then within within there, you can decide a network can have multiple subnetworks. So you decide which subnetwork to go to. Within subnetworks, you can decide which which ledger because these networks can have multiple uh, Figure out what is the uh, uh, what is the contract, what is the function, and so on. So that's a, a particular hierarchy that we want to capture through that uh, that that string that that you added and uh, it it was uh, uh, yeah it, it was good enough for for those purposes. And we have by the way I uh, uh, added some links in the chat before I started speaking. You can see there are there's a draft called uh, these are candidate draft. These are not at this point part of the SCTP scope, but these are also there uh, uh, in the SCTP drafts list. If you go check out the view, draft, there's a draft on views and there's a draft on data sharing that talks about uh, the how exactly you create a view address, uh, the, the full uh, uh, schema and the full format defined for that and how you uh, use the view address uh, to uh, request data from another network and then get a view back. So uh, we have draft for that uh, uh, and I have presented on that in, in past IT meetings as well. So you go and check those out and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have on that later. You know, you can of course ping me on the Cacti one of the Cacti Discord channels anytime you want. And then uh, there's yeah. one more question from Kalida. Can I get more clarity on implementing Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum using Cacti? Implementing Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum? You mean? Uh, yes, I suspect it's a little bit out of scope to answer all of that right now, but maybe a few pointers would help. Yeah, I, my, I'm guessing she's asking about how you make the, uh, like you can do an asset transfer between a fabric network and, a, and an Ethereum network. So you'll have to uh, identify the right components on the different uh, that are available through the various packages uh, within Cacti. And you'll have to then stitch the packages together in order to create the uh, the end-to-end -end flow. So I'm going to show you an example of how you can do this in the uh, using using the relays and and drivers and how you can do. There's a I'll just do a demo of a movement of an asset from one network to another. Okay. Hopefully this makes uh, you appreciate what this can do. Okay. So I just started two fabric test networks. Okay, uh, I already started this because it takes a few minutes to, to launch. You can see here, each of these networks has just a single peer, a single order, a single CA. So there's a network one, there's a network two. And I installed uh, this, this chain code is the Cacti chain code that I installed there. And that is supposed to be doing functions like locking and so on. Uh, you can see that chain code is installed on the peer in network two. It's also installed on the peer network one. And then the chain code that's holding the assets, the, uh, we, we wrote a sample chain code for that. We called it SATP simple asset. And uh, that's also deployed. Uh, it's running on both, both networks. Okay. So what are we trying to do here? So you have network one uh, running a SATP simple asset chain code, which governs particular assets in network one. Uh, we're going to be trying to send an asset from this chain code to this chain code, okay? From uh, this network to this network, but effectively it's from one chain code to another because of the chain codes that are governing this asset in, in fabric. So uh, 
Let me first go ahead and initialize uh, some assets on the on network one. Okay. So yeah, just give it a few seconds. So this is what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to be creating certain assets on uh, in network one. What that means is that I'm going to be sending a bunch of transactions to start with simple assets so it can mint a, a bunch of dummy assets. Okay. And then uh, in, in a few seconds, I'll be triggering a transfer of one of those assets to the, the other network. So okay, ignore all these logs. So this is, this is what we have. And okay, now I'm going to try and uh, so let me just see. Sorry, just give me a quick second. But the instruction for this lie in, we have this here inside the cat side page. Sorry. If you point out where this is, you can, if you want to run this by yourself, by the way, you clone, clone cat type and then just go into this particular path, we will go really docs and you find the same set of instructions that I'm going to demonstrate right now. Uh, so let me just go and I just want to copy this down here. This is what I was looking for. And all right. Okay. So I'm going to query for the existence of a particular kind of asset in, in network one. Okay. I provided parameters users Alice and I provided uh, an asset type and an asset ID. So this is a type which we named as bond01 and the ID is called A05. And this should give me the details of the asset because user in Alice does hold an asset like this in network one. So you can see this, uh, you just ignore all the base64 uh, uh, strings you see here. Uh, what this query returns is uh, affirmative information that Alice holds this particular bond in network one. Okay. Uh, and uh, just for completeness, I'm going to also query, just make sure that Bob and network two does not have this asset. Because what is my goal here? My goal is to transfer this particular asset from Alice in network one to Bob in network two. Okay. And the way the logic works is we are appending in the, the new network, we just appending this underscore new to the type and the, uh, and, and the ID, just so we can show that it's distinct from the first, uh, uh, from the asset that I was actually sent. Because uh, if you imagine there's no obligation on the part of the recipient network to use the same naming convention for a particular asset as the sending network. So here we just chose a, a different naming convention. And as you can see here, this says the asset does not exist, which means the asset does not lie in the distinction network as what we, uh, we know. Uh, so, okay, now I'm going to start a uh, network. I'm going to start the relay for network one here. So note the uh, top left, this is the relay for network one, the sending network, and here's the relay for network and as a relay needs a fabric driver, this is the fabric driver for network one. And this is the fabric driver for network two. Uh, they're using different kind of parameters. That's you need them to instantiate the drivers with the, the right configuration. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger a cross node transaction. Uh, so as I mentioned here, uh, we added a, uh, yeah, added a new client, satpi client or added. So we just created a client in order, uh, in, in Rust, in order to be able to just trigger a, an asset transfer via this relay. This is the relay for the first network. I'm going back here. 
the client is going to just ask this relay to send an asset from Alice in this network to Bob in this network. Okay. So that's what the client is going to do. So if you can see, I think this may be a bit small. I'll once again. Uh, yeah, you can see here I'm providing a laundry list of uh, arguments. Uh, just what this means is send, it is asking this relay, which we named as fabric relay, uh, to send uh, an asset owned by Alice called bond01 and, and ID A05 from its network one, which is governed by the SATP simple asset chain code to network two via the relay fabric relay two to the recipient Bob. And that asset is again governed by the same SATP simple asset chain code. So we have, they had to provide all these instructions for the gateways or the relays to get the complete transfer context. That is, uh, who should the asset be transferred between? So I'm going to do this. And you can see here, uh, sorry, I did this on the wrong folder. All right, I'm going to run this from here. All right, so you see this, the submitted says asset transfer request submitted successfully. Now you see a lot of things happening here. You can see here various steps getting reported. Now there's the relay on the left or the gateway on the left. This is gateway G1 according to. And if you go back to and look at the, the diagram. Um, yeah. So gateway G2, this is basically the last thing it's going to record step 3.6D. Whereas gateway G1, it's going to record up to step 3.9. And that's what you see here. Step 3.9 simply says transaction concluded. Step 3.6B is basically network two's way of saying that asset was minted at its end, and it's up to the first gateway, the sending gateway, to close out the transaction. And the the drivers here, uh, let me just try to unpack what it's saying. You can see at some stage in the middle, it says asset lost successfully. Later on, it says asset extinguished successfully. So a lock happened and then a burn happened. And on the driver on the right, this is the recipient network. It's going to, uh, it, it, it created a, a, an asset here. And, and later on, it successfully assigned that asset to the recipient, to the right recipient, Bob. Okay. Now let's see if the transfer actually succeeded. The proof is if you, if the chain code return the right information we're seeking. Go back to the right. So we are checking whether or not the asset is still still live with Alice in network one. Uh, earlier, remember when we tried this, we got an affirmative answer. Let's see what we get now. The asset doesn't exist. So at least one part of the one end of the protocol got fulfilled. Let's see the other one. Sorry for this query being rather slow. I think you know, if anybody is interested in getting better performance from our clients, then don't welcome to contribute to the to the project. Um, so you can see here now, Bob, the recipient, does have an asset, and Alice does not. So the Alice successfully was able to transfer an or SATP was able to successfully transfer this asset from Alice in network one to Bob in network two. So that's basically the uh, the demo. Now, just go back. I think I've been talking for a very long time now. So, uh, the rest of the slides really are uh, uh, just showing you like 
you know, these are the functions that we implemented corresponding to the different steps in the protocol within the uh, within the Rust GRPC service, which is our relay. And uh, by the way, the diagram here refers to if you go to the uh, GitHub repository where we maintain these documents, we are using B19 right now. The version, the latest version, B20, but it got updated only like a few weeks ago. Whereas this implementation had been done much earlier. So. But there's not much difference between V19 and V20. It's just about moving uh, a particular stage boundary from one page to another. So otherwise, the protocol basically remains the same. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a protocol representing a set of GRPs and service endpoints, and uh, just showing a particular implementation samples. Uh, so we want to be able to uh, extend this to other kinds of networks as i mentioned earlier the relay is dlt agnostic so the augmentation of uh, the satp in the rust relay module will work for basically any kind of system it's not just for a fabric network my demo works on fabric because there's a lot more you need to have to uh, to do a full end to end transfer than just the the gateway functions uh, and we were able to do that for fabric it it requires a lot of work to, uh, you know, build uh, the support for different different uh, uh, DLTs. So, you know, anybody who's interested, please uh, happy to have you, you know, contribute. And uh, it'll be a pretty challenging, challenging project. So, you know, uh, I do encourage all of you to try and contribute if you're so interested. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, this, we also added login, and this is something I, I just want to show that we did. Uh, I'll let Rafael speak to this. Uh, there is, there's, a, there's a gateway uh, database built on uh, SQLite that we're using in the relay, and that's actually uh, uh, dumping logs to a particular uh, database. So let me just quickly show you what that uh, might contain. So it's, uh, it's something like this. So uh, just converting the database into a SQL representation, you get a bunch of logs getting inserted and uh, you can use your favorite SQL editor to view these in a, uh, in, in a more readable manner. Uh, mainly why we need logs, as Rafael talked about, is for crash recovery, fault tolerance, alterability, and so on. It's it's like it's crucial. Without, without proper logging, the, the protocol can be quite uh, uh, flimsy in practice. Um, all right, going back to this. Okay, so what do we have left? This is not a complete implementation, by the way. The all the networking architecture is there, all the service APIs are, are done, data structures are there, logging code is in place. Uh, though we would ideally like to support more storage types than just SQLite, which we have. Uh, but a lot of the internal functions within the relay and the fabric driver are right now hard coded. We just built it just for a particular demo, so we do need to make them general purpose. Uh, production ready. Okay, so that's work still pending. Uh, APIs between relay and relay is what we are trying to standardize with the, with the particular spec, at least for asset transfer. We do need to also standardize relay to network and relay to client APIs. So we are in the process of designing them and uh, you just watch out for more drafts under the happy working group umbrella. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we need to also augment other drivers for, for other kinds of networks. Uh, just, just shout out to our uh, Overall project, just go and uh, you know check out the documentation and happy to get your, your contributions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll stop sharing uh, screen. Yeah, so I can see the chat. Hey, go on. We have a couple more questions. So Kalida was clarifying their earlier question by saying data passing is what they were asking about between. Fabric and uh, public Ethereum. They're data asking if, means, uh, the same as data, data transfer or data sharing, right? What what it about? Yeah, I, I think, think it means the same thing. That's how I would also yeah. interpret. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we have to see. I think at this point, at least uh, within the Weaver parts, um, what we have support for are uh, we have more support for Fabric and Corda as compared to 
compared to Beidou uh, by extension Ethereum. So uh, for there's a matrix, if you go inside the viewer folder, you see a matrix of what kind of DLT we support and for what modes. You see a, you see a table there. Um, for for Bezo, we don't, uh, at least using the viewer module, we don't support data sharing yet, but it is, it's on the card. I mean, we've had designs for ages. Uh, it's just the implementation bandwidth just hasn't, hasn't happened yet. So again, anybody is interested, they want to contribute. Honestly, uh, I should mention that we had a mentorship project on this topic exactly last year. Unfortunately, the the mentee dropped out within a couple of months and was not able to complete the project. So if anybody's interested, if you are keen on spending time, be happy to share the design with you and you just have to go and implement it. Uh, of course, uh, I think the Cactus has uh, several other packages on uh, Bezo and Ethereum, right? So I think Peter can talk about that. Maybe even Rafael knows about that. So I don't know, Peter, you want to, you want to say something about Ethereum? Ethereum support? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Do you want to say anything about uh, Ethereum support within uh, Cactus? Yeah. So what we have right now is coverage for basic operations, as in there is an Ethereum connector in the project. And then the eventual build will have contracts for it. And I would like to let Rafael speak because he has his hand raised. Great. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Maybe I can shed some light because I was using it the other day. Uh, I think most of the work was done by Peter and uh, Michal. I, I think the the maintainers. And so this plugin is the Ethereum connector and it allows you to connect to any EVM-based chain. So essentially, if you have an RPC URL that can give you access to Ethereum nodes, you can read from the Ethereum, um, Polygon, Arbitrum, all these networks that are EVM based. And the functionalities go a long way. I think you can read from contracts, you can write to contracts, uh, you can monitor blocks and, and do things based on incoming blocks, archiving them, for example. So I think there's a very nice core set of functionalities that, that, that we already have out of the box. Thanks, Rafa. I think that should clarify kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. And there's one more question from Jeff. For example, transaction integrity is relatively straightforward when under the control of a single engine, e.g. database manager, but transfers between two different network protocols would seem to be more problematic. Oh, so that might be just a comment, not a question. Sorry. Yeah, so um, you would think relates, so. Again, it depends on, sorry, somebody's saying. No, it relates, relates to transaction and uh, commit integrity in case it fails. I noticed, I asked the question because in your example, you show that the asset was removed from network one. Yeah. What happens if it doesn't get put on network two? So the protocol is meant to ensure that uh, if the two gateways are compliant, this cannot happen. Now, of course, gateways may not be compliant and we have to uh, watch out for that eventuality. That's why we have these logs uh, that, I, that I mentioned at the end. Uh, Rafael, will talk about them. Logs are basically checkpoints that, that show what's, what's going on at the different uh, endpoints. Now, this may not be completely satisfactory, but uh, because you're talking about two completely independent networks, independent gateways, and a completely decentralized setup uh, may not actually be possible to get a ensure that if one party is non-compliant, you you can fix it within the context of a transaction. But what you can do is you can, given the logs, uh, you can audit uh, the protocol after the event, and you'll know whether or not a gateway was compliant or not, and uh, that will aid in uh, dispute resolution. Uh, Rafael, go on. Let me add something to that. So I think this is one of the key questions. Um, so the quick answer is if one of the parties does not comply, then the invariance that we have defined as part of our security model, which essentially is we have to avoid sort of cross-chain double spend. Well, they will be violated, meaning that there will be a double spend and, um, and the transfer is not considered to be valid or successful. Now, there are a series of 
technical and non-technical mechanisms to to avail, uh, alleviate this. Uh, since gateways are independent, we cannot force them to to follow the protocol. They can be uh, misbehaving. So the non-technical mechanisms are simple. Each gateway signs their operation, so they they are accountable for what they do, and every operation is written ahead of um, ahead of time, meaning that those operations are persisted and optimally distributed. This leads to to a series of steps that are persisted and are visible to parties that are inspecting the protocol. So this is one of the non-technical mechanisms that we use to alleviate the security problem. The other is that if, um, which can be more technical, we, we could possibly create proofs. So as, as of now, the set P proofs are more like notarization, especially if you are operating within a private blockchain. A set of parties notarize that a certain action has been done and uh, we create a view on it and Rama has done really foundational work on this end. And then you send this view to the other side and it serves as a proof. Now, there are more, there are other technical mechanisms that could help us create a proof. So we could create a zero knowledge proof that a certain action has occurred in a private network and this proof could be verified outside of this network. Um, and if this happens, then we would have more assurances that the, well, the transfer was conducted successfully. Now, that is also another case. If, if the party uh, misbehaves, the, does he, that party won't be able to create the proof because, uh, because of the soundness property of serial knowledge proofs. But then we'll have an asset in an inconsistent state. So the solution for this is that the smart contracts to which you are doing the burns, doing the locks, doing the means, doing the escrows and so on, those contracts effectively con constitute a bridge. And this is outside of the scope of our work. So we leave these bridge implementations, um, a wide range of bridge implementations are possible. We just, uh, for now, um, recommend a certain model. Now, this bridge can be implemented in such a way that it minimizes uh, such facts, um, such occurrences uh, by sacrificing latency, namely. You could have a multi-sig bridge that has multiple non-trusting parties that if uh, an action um, is not performed, then they'll step in and do that, that uh, action, um, maybe similarly to optimistic rollups, you could have watchers. So you could decentralize your solution in a in a variety of ways to to alleviate this problem. Uh, Jeff, yeah, I appreciate that um, explanation. I I only raise the issue because the method for um, fixing a failed transaction. Uh, in the traditional transaction integrity sense, is a rollback, and a rollback reverses things that happen in the in the log. If you're dealing with actions that have been already committed to one network in an immutable fashion, you have a totally different problem, which is um, quite challenging. And your your discussion of the bridge concept uh, almost implies that there needs to be some form of other uh, intermediary that can guarantee somehow concurrent. Uh, two-phase commits on the two networks in order for uh, transaction integrity of that of that nature uh, can be applied. I just think it's it's a very interesting and challenging problem for financial uh, transactions as opposed to informational transactions. Quite different, of course. You you know you lose something from a website or a blog, you can repost it. But if you are actually doing, it's not a double spin problem. It's a double loss problem more so than anything else. So it just was. Uh, you know, this is this is a, a very timely topic because everybody is talking about tokenization, digital assets, and transfers uh, between uh, different protocols. But I do believe it is a fundamental issue with uh, with um, 
DLT protocols that require uh, proof of stake, proof of work in order to have all the nodes commit, let's say on the Ethereum side, whereas Hyperledger Fabric may have a much easier way of dealing with this because it has more control. So I just think it's a quite challenging issue. I only raise it just because I am I think it is one that's gonna be hard to solve, but I appreciate your comments, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Well, let me just have a quick follow-up. This is definitely, it has raised a lot of discussion within the group because it's obviously, obviously not, not a simple problem. What we, uh, the direction we tried to pursue at the beginning, uh, at studying this initial problem, uh, many of the learnings are in our fresh recovery draft, also a bit in the core draft and in our academic papers. But essentially what we've tried to do was to create an abstraction over uh, two PCs such that we had a rollback operation in the context of blockchains. Now, most blockchains do not support rollbacks, so um, the, the the abstraction essentially triggers the transaction with the contrary effect to to the first transaction. Um, and if we keep track of the flow of operations, which we do in our logs, then rolling back is the matter of creating opposite effects uh, backwards. So that was that was the initial thinking. It appears to work. Now, if there are um, consequences or um, or if it introduces problems on the regulation level, yes, probably it does. And possibly we'll explore that in the next level where we will explore real world use cases and possibly work a bit with the regulators. But I, I think definitely it's, it's the problem that it's non-trivial. Jim? Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, the model that you're working from matters a lot. And so just going back to the fundamentals of we look at, I'll call it a database models, operations, and patterns. The thing that makes DeFi weak is that the transaction patterns, and you saw it like Project Hamilton and so on, they use this, they take the simplest model possible, which doesn't fit many real world use cases. The example is UTXO. It does apply to certain scenarios and that is the simplest pattern possible. And then you look at how to do transactions in that and fine, it works great. The problem is when you introduce the real world dimensions, which are many, there's about 15 of them in my mind, um, all that falls apart and you're seeing it here when you go to this interop problem. So what you really have, and I think to keep the architecture clean and the model clean, you need to separate 100% the fact that ledger operations are, in a sense, not transactions ever. They're two different things. A transaction and a ledger operation um, have a relationship, but they're not at all the same. And you have to start from that uh, different assumption that most, um, a lot of DLTs don't have. When you look at that, I built a time series um, high-speed database for Apple. Uh, it wasn't blockchain because it didn't hash the blocks. It had blocks, but they weren't hashed to your, you know, which makes it diff makes it not blockchain or DLT. But in doing that, I separated the transactions from the ledger operations. And so the simple problem actually of rollback wasn't challenging at all because the ledger operations were always um, just applied sequentially. And the transaction, whether it was roll back, roll forward, whatever I needed to do was independent of the individual ledger operations. So in effect, what the transaction was, the state of a transaction was always what I call the um, ordered um, the ordered impact of all the ledger op operations applied in sequence, period. So that flexibility can be handled across any kind of a decentralized network as an architecture for sure. I mean, it works. And so I think you need to have, I'll call it a more open model for what a transaction is and the relationship to a ledger for sure. And if you if you don't do that, you're stuck. So going back to the earlier, uh, as Jeff said, if you look at Durda, um, the two-phase commit model, that architecture works at the transaction level just fine. And if you keep ledgers separate from the transactions, you're gonna be fine. But there's some assumptions there that are very different in the architecture for what it's worth. 
uh, let me follow up uh, on that. I think you touched in many, many interesting points. Um, and I, I think I agree with most of what you said. Now here, I think also we have um, an issue of semantics. What we mean by transaction, uh, a ledger update, a ledger operation. Now, if those ledger op operations constitute financial transactions, that's a bit of, that's, that, that's to be discussed, I would say. And at the same time, the SETP protocol, I think solves the, this problem that you've been uh, reflecting on, uh, the fact that uh, the DeFi industry doesn't seem to provide the level of complexity that is needed for real world applications. I tend to agree. I think SETP is one of these solutions because it creates abstractions over the ledger. So if SETP can perform these uh, asset transfers atomically, then we can build a lot of different uh, models and architectures uh, according to the specific business logic that needs to be implemented. So this happens at the gateway client uh, application, uh, which also has the responsibility of doing this orchestration. Um, maybe this gateway client is the one that decides what is a transaction based on the set of ledger operations that that the conducts. Now we've been using this terminology since the beginning because it's uh, very consistent with the blockchain industry, perhaps not super consistency, consistent with uh, the financial uh, service industry. Uh, I suppose that by transaction, you mean a legal settled uh, operation that transfers value. I would agree, you're right. Your second view of what the transaction is, as you call it, a, 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 um, I'll call it a, a legal operation, if you will, of some type, whatever it is for a financial domain or anything, is, a, is one good, definition of that for me, for sure. And I would say the entire DeFi space isn't capable of that as it sort of architects. And I would agree that in a sense, the protocol you're proposing um, along with any other model, um, and there were similar ones, I think, none that I know of that are in production or anything, but similar models have been proposed that solve that problem. So I'm arguing that yes, there is a life cycle to a real transaction that has, you know, I'll call it legal validation, financial impacts, or whatever else it does. And that ledgers actually um, can be simply managed uh, honestly uh, without worrying about the complexity directly of what the transaction is. Where is it? What is it? And all that. And your architecture is a good, great step, I'll say, in the right direction of making that separation. Somehow the communication in the slides doesn't do that in my my mind. Do you know what I mean? I would, it's almost like there's a, if I said to you, show me the slide, which has the, there was a problem statement slide. There was a goal slide. I didn't see a, an assumption slide. So I would have, and the assumptions really, in my case, relate to what is your strategy, which you have actually, for what the solution architecture is going to look like. So you actually have all of that. I would just would have put together in my head my assumption slide that says, hey, here's my starting points. And I would like you to challenge them in a sense, throw them out there. And one of my starting points, again, was the idea that ledger operations um, are not at all um, transactions. They are just ledger operations. But yet the sum of those ledger operations is they uh, applied uh, in order will eventually be um, the current state of the, the transaction. And that opens up a lot of doors that haven't been opened up in the DLT space right now. So if I said, how do you scale it 50 or 100 times? It's because I'm starting off with a different assumption. And all of a sudden, things like ordering don't have to be done um, um, before you apply a transaction. They can be done after you apply a transaction. Uh, sorry, after you apply ledger operations. So there's a lot of constraints that exist in the DLT space that don't belong there, in my opinion, and are going to hold back in a sense, real world um, solutions. But the good news is your project, and I'll say the IETF you know, protocol model is the right place to, um, I'll call it build that more sophisticated architecture that's gonna address the real world use cases. So it's like, you, you know, back to the original point, we ought to be, as Thomas said, we should all be uh, playing in that space and trying to contribute to what your team is working on. Because I think that has, that architecture has, uh, I'll call it, the opportunity to meet all of the complexities 
of the real world legal transactions that DeFi literally never will hit for sure. Uh, Jim, uh, please uh, do maybe reply to the subscribe to the SAP mailing thread and mailing list and reply to uh, to that. And that'd be great. I think we'd like to hear your opinions and then we can have a discussion there. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. That's the right thing. So thank you again for I'll call it making. I'll call it a useful architecture um, and then showing us that it's actually executable. So I certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I, maybe Rafael understands better than better than I do, but I'm not exactly sure I get the why you want to issue transactions and uh, just have ledger operation. But I, I think we will we'll go down a rabbit hole if we do that now. So uh, just, uh, you know, it'd be great if you could uh, find the thread and uh, or start a discussion thread on the SAPI mailing list and we'd be happy to discuss that. We have any more right. questions? I don't see any more hands, and I don't see any more chat questions either. Uh, so I'll, I, th I think I'll present my part. Please go ahead, Rafael. I, I'm not planning to take too long. Um, I'll present an overview of the SETI Hermes implementation, uh, also related to the conversations we have we had right now presenting some um, well prospects for real world use cases that we are currently exploring. Um, at this point, this is still the the research is still fairly uh, at the beginning. But as long as we get updates, we'll be able to share hopefully. All right. Um, right, oh, so Rafael, please take as long as you need to. We have plenty of time. So, all right, and then I, I, I'm not planning to take much. Okay, all right. So, this is the, the high level architecture for, and I would say it it wouldn't be radically different from the, um, the, the Weaver Rust implementation. and Essentially, we um, we are hosting the set P code inside a hyperledger cacti. Hyperledger cacti has the notion of cacti node, which is essential contains or it's an interface that defines an API server uh, class, and this class is a, a sort of container that can do load balancing that can call different plugins. And it's a, it's sort of interface for the external world um, outside of Cacti. So we essentially instantiate this Cacti node with the set P plugin. This set P plugin can use different ledger connectors. So we can connect to permission private blockchains such as Hyperledger Bezlu, Hyperledger Fabric, or to public blockchains such as Ethereum and other EVM uh, based blockchains. This is due to us reusing the different plugin uh, ledger connectors that we have available in Cacti. So this one all uh, this was also one of the reasons why we thought Cacti was the best place for us to develop our research and our protocol. Set P, our Hermes implementation, also connects to a couple of different things. One of them is a plugin called Bungie, which does one implementation of the blockchain view concept that generates proofs of ledger operations or transactions, if you will. And apart from this, we are planning to have a set of adapters. Uh, it's the finest API type three, I believe, in our specifications. And these adapters essentially connect to the outside world. So they could be an SDK to, let's say, encourage uh, the digital bank or to block demon, the infrastructure provider, or to IBM, whatever service that can provide data for us to build SETP power apps. Now, the SETP gateway is stateless, meaning that 
uh, well, the state, the information it saves, it's the, the session, right? But it does not the it does not do out of the box, at least business logic orchestration. And that's why we define an API such that clients can use this gateway to perform atomic uh, operations. And these applications themselves, they orchestrate their business logic. They can build, um, they can build abstractions. They can implement their use case. So by doing this, we can decouple the business logic from the gateway logic, from the ledger connections, and so on. In a bit more detail, the client application is a software component. And by the way, these. Uh, diagrams are made using Archimate. It's a business process um, language to define, well, organizations pretty much, but this explains the application layer. So this client application has access to this BLO, uh, which is essentially an SDK. And this SDK defines much simpler interfaces than the messages that are defined in set P core. Now, I will show you what this might look like. We are still, there is still no draft, but this could be a very interesting draft for, for SETP because it defines a simple interface where applications can interact with. And these messages are then translated in SETP flow specific messages. Okay. So this implements API 1. And then the request comes from the client, hits the API server, and then goes to the different different software software modules that we have implemented for uh, setP the TypeScript implementation. And so this is more from a technical point of view. We have different components: the gateway, which is the core protocol implementation. Then we have a gateway orchestration layer, so essentially a piece of code that enables your gateway to connect and discover other gateways. We have the adapter layer that connects to external services. You you have the, actually the gateway implements routing logic and the set P core implements the core of the protocol. So receives a message, validates the message, returns the response. Essentially that's it. And, and yes, so this orchestration layer allows to communicate with other gateways. So the orchestration layer is not, it does not implement API 2. What implements API 2 is actually set P core, but I guess the, the gateway orchestration layer allows to connect to other gateways. So in that sense, it's also API 2. And then API 3 is communication with external services. So the adapter layer. And then the, the gateway sends the request to another Cacti node that can be hosted you know, over the internet. And that request will then be forwarded to, to its specific gateway. Uh, we have uh, uh, perhaps a bit more detailed diagram here using the C4 model, which is a very simple model. We'll share the slides so you don't need to, to copy anything now. The functionalities that we want to define and to expose via the gateway client, uh, we've thought about, again, this is work in progress, but we thought about what are the core functionalities that a gateway should offer in order to satisfy a reasonable number of use cases. And this is pretty much an open question because there are, there are no standards and this is done uh, by our exploration of the implementation, let's say, taking into account what were our specific needs. So one of them was, to submit an intent of a transaction. So we could schedule a transaction, um, a cross-chain transaction, um, and the gateway will verify when it's the best time to issue that transaction. We want to understand also what are the, the possible routes for an asset transfer. Imagine if you want to go from Hyperledger Fabric to Ethereum, you might have one hop, one gateway connected to both, but not necessarily. In the future, we might have a gateway of, a network of gateways, and this is pretty much the goal, where only some gateways have access to some blockchain. And this assumes a sort of routing procedure, like it happens on the internet architecture nowadays. So the gateway has to be able to tell the the client application, the end user, what are the different routes that we can that the gateway can resolve 
for an asset transfer. And this could be one, this could be many. Uh, of course, with these different routes, maybe we can have fees, maybe we can have different costs, uh, maybe we have more public gateways that mostly address public blockchain. Maybe we have more enterprise grade gateways that have um, that focus more on on security and privacy. That is, I think, a possibly very big market for this. And then we could also uh, we could uh, I don't think the set P core draft and protocol considers this at the moment, but in the future we could even consider the possibility of canceling transactions, especially if we, um, instead of transaction, we write intent. So this could be done at the local gateway or the gateway could send a message to another gateway, right? Sometimes the finalization times on blockchains are very long and more logic like this might be possible. I'm not saying it's desirable, I'm saying it's possible. And this is more or less what we've came with for the uh, API one, well, let's say version zero. Uh, we would consider two families of endpoints, one of them to conduct the transaction. So the, the action stuff is here. And then another one more administration like capabilities. So for the, the transaction, you can submit an intent, maybe you can cancel it. You might get the list of integrations, these being, let's say, the decentralized exchanges, the centralized exchanges, the bridges, the other gateways that your gateway is connected to, and getting the route. On the admin side, you would like to see what is the status of a certain session. And the session ID comes from the application. The uh, current gateway can retrieve this uh, status either via local state or by calling another gateway if it doesn't have enough data, health check, continue transactions if we have a cancel endpoint, pause a transaction, and an audit endpoint, right? After generating so much data, this verifiable log of operations, then obviously we'll need a way to retrieve these in a, in a format that makes sense to auditors, whatever that is. As of now, we are planning to support a few chains. So all EVM based because the, the Ethereum connector that our colleagues kindly implemented supports all EVM based chains. So that automatically gives us dozens of supported blockchains. Then private ones, Fabric and Bezu, although Bezu can also be public. And then we were planning on supporting the European blockchain services. Uh, infrastructure. So it's the European level blockchain that allows to, well, it, it aims to streamline processes at public administration. So for example, education credentials and so on. So it would be interesting to see use cases where our gateways can read from this blockchain. I think writing to this blockchain is much harder, but um, this technology is pretty much being explored at this point. Right? Uh, regarding the demos, so we are currently doing a heavy refactoring of the set the Hermes TypeScript code. Uh, so we don't have new demos yet, but I'll give you here references to demos using the previous version. Uh, the idea is that the, 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 interface, the interfaces will be slightly changed, but the core protocol remains the same. So that is... Um, a quick demo I've done on the on a previous Cacti workshop where we explain uh, different parts of the code, also pointing a bit to set P. And that is also a central bank digital currency, very simple, um, well, use case description that uh, my colleague Andrea Augusto implemented and also uh, made a demo. So the, those links are both referring to the Cacti workshop with different timestamps. Um, in order for you to run the demos, you uh, probably have to install or to build the project. The, the instructions are on Cacti slash build. And you can also use the dev container, which um, 
on VS Code, it spawns uh, an environment with the dependencies installed. Just note that the the Cacti is a heavy project. I think we can we can say that, and you probably need to be very sure uh, to be very safe around sixteen gigas uh, of RAM and probably fifty to sixty gigas of storage. But uh, if I'm saying bad values, Peter, please correct me. Uh, perhaps we can address some questions before going. Okay, no one has raised their hands. Um, uh, hello? Hi. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Jatin, and um, I just had a general doubt of like where does uh, this come in uh, compared to the previous uh, network? Is it a layer over it? Or is it like alongside, like does SATP uh, algorithm, is it like over the previous one as a layer or is it alongside uh, like what was being explained earlier by Venkat Raman, sir? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. Uh, are, are you asking if set P is ran on top of the underlying networks without any abstraction layer in between? Hmm, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, for the existing like Weaver and uh, uh, for like, is it alongside the Weaver uh, protocol or is it like a layer above uh, Weaver? Like, where does it stand mm. compared to the existing systems? The okay. Uh, okay, I think I understand it now. Uh, so the question is basically, what are the differences between the implementations? I suppose um, the the systems are our our objective with Cacti is to approximate the implementations as, as much as possible. However. Um, we believe it is good to have a variety of implementations uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that different programming languages have different programming models and therefore carry different uh, implementation, implementation paradigms. For example, Rust is very memory safe and JavaScript is precisely the opposite. However, JavaScript and in particular TypeScript has probably the best supported community for blockchain based projects because TypeScript is a very popular language. Uh, that is one of the reasons why Cacti is written in TypeScript. Uh, however, if you prefer to have uh, better memory guarantees, uh, super strongly typed system, then Rust might be a good language for you. Another reason is that having a variety of implementations is a good thing. This is very keenly defended in the Ethereum ecosystem where you have the implementation of the Ethereum protocol done in multiple different languages. You have the, the Nimbus client in Nim, you, get, you have Gas in Golang, you have a Python implementation as well, and so on. And you have Rust, I think, in Rust. That, that's probably the latest client. So you have a lot of different clients and the rationale for um, diversifying the, the, the investments on different implementations is that if there is a critical bug in one of the implementations of the protocol that causes, for example, the network to, to freeze, then this will be mitigated by the fact that there are multiple different implementations. And I think this is a really good case that justifies the existence of different set P implementations. Different set P implementations might also provide different uh, sandboxes for implementing use cases, right? Because much of the set P protocol, much of the necessary information and infrastructure that underlines the correct execution of set P is not defined and it's not implemented uh, because we need to focus. As Thomas said, we cannot specify everything. And one thing, right at the time, might probably the right approach. So this leaves a lot of space for different implementations and different philosophies. You can implement the bridge in many different ways. You certainly can implement an, an insecure bridge in many different ways. Uh, we've found out uh, in our recent study that around 3.2 billion USD worth of tokens 
were stolen from crossing bridges in the last three years. That's $1 billion per year. It's a lot of money. So hopefully, uh, while SETP does not implement the bridge by itself, it can certainly, we can certainly implement a SETP like bridge. Um, I tend to like the idea that we could have a bridge aggregator interface. So essentially, bridge aggregator would be an abstraction over a number of bridges that uses different bridges to conduct operations. This is more on the data sharing side. Uh, so when you want to send a piece of data, you typically attach a proof and different bridges might do it differently. If you send that data and the other side receives the same data from all the bridges and the same proof from all the bridges, then you could be reasonable, certain that uh, that information is correct. So this is a bit rational for aggregating the results of different bridges to provide some more levels of fault tolerance. Um, and, and you can even rule out faulty bridges by having a quorum or something. So I, I, I hope this addresses your question. Um, there is a lot of reasons for having different implementations, but the implementation's core is meant to be respecting the, the protocol and the specification as much as possible. Nonetheless, of course, there are bugs and and uh, we can only find them and fix them. Well, we can also try to prevent them, which is certainly what we're doing. Right, um, I'll, I'll go on. I would like to talk a bit briefly about a Portuguese project called blockchain.pt. Um, so this is where the discussion about use cases come into play. So this is a research project, all right? So um, real world is maybe not here right now, but the idea of this project is to join companies, research and development organizations, partners with the government to develop solutions that aim to be productized and exported, hopefully. Um, so that is going to be a, an horizontal layer, which is the interoperability layer, which will connect these different projects. And this layer will be implemented with SETP. The reason why we chose SETP or why the project has chosen SETP for this, SETP is meant to integrate legacy infrastructure with private chains, with public chains, and with other systems. And this flexibility alone, given the also the focused scope of SETP, makes this a uh, very likely strong candidate to, uh, to implement the interoperability across all these different and uh, heterogeneous use cases. Now, along the project that will finalize in 2025, we'll have the opportunity to work with these companies, discover what are what they are what what they want to do what are their use cases what are their interoperation capabilities and necessities and with that we can refine api type 1 api type 3 which which is the gateway client the adapter layer and possibly also have uh, feedback on the core protocol my take is that the core protocol will probably not change a lot because it does it has a very narrow scope. Uh, however, API 1 and API 3, those will change a lot and we'll be working with Rama and Andrea Augusto on specifying this layer, of course, along with the rest of the team too. And this consortium has, um, well, set piece implementation, so consortium apart, um, partners, project partners apart, there, there are a lot of contributors to, to set P, some universities, some research organizations, uh, IBM, Block Demon, Quant, which is also a, a company that is interested in blockchain gateways, and of course, Hyperledger. We already talked about the different implementations. Thank you for the question. And I would like to let you um, see and, and think a bit about uh, our SETP roadmap, namely the SETP Hermes implementation that we have planned for this year. So. Um, we are currently working on the formalization of the architecture. 
via Archimate, and this will allow for people to look at the diagrams and to understand exactly what's happening. This um, architecture formalization already has a lot of work on it because it's based on the on the SFP model on our research, and so this is more of a technical support for future implementers. Right? And we are also refactoring uh, the implementation. We the, the previous implementation had crash recovery out of uh, out of the box. So if the if a transaction flow was interrupted in the middle, it would do the the rollback the, the rollback. Uh, but we need to re-implement it. We need to think about audit and, and compliance. Uh, we need to think if we should extend our support for other chains or which chains are the best candidates for being integrated into SETP and so on. Uh, later down the road, we have, um, we, we would like to conduct a, a bigger experiment. So a sort of a SETP sandbox where we deploy a gateway and let clients who are authenticated to, in, to integrate with this gateway. And it would be very interesting if you would have access to this uh, European blockchain services infrastructure. There are also, a set of supporting drafts, let's call them like that, which are, for example, the asset profile, the network identification. For instance, the network identification talks or uh, specifies how how does a, a gateway uniquely identify any of the different blockchain and non-blockchain networks that are available. And then um, uh, to conclude, we have a set of technical uh, improvements in observability. So on this project, on the open source implementations of our project, we want people to be able to take the codes and to execute the code and to have and to have the best developer experiences possible. Uh, and observability is one of them. We want to know the state of the gateway at each time, the state of the transfer at each time, and so on. So this is more engineering focused than, uh, let's say, standardization or research focused. Um, the SETP Hermes implementation is open source and the project management is open source as well. So we, we track our issues, what's being developed at the moment uh, at GitHub in the Cacti project. So we have the issues marked with uh, IETF SETP, Hermes, I think. And and, and and we just do project management there. Everything is very, very transparent. Um, yeah, uh, we're approaching the end. I would like to welcome you to the community. You can check our Discord. I think that's the best place to start. We have a wiki. We have uh, Peter, especially, uh, has spent a great deal of time writing down the contributing guidelines. How can you contribute? Also, how can you uh, do your first issue relatively independently? Peter also hosts the pair programming meetings where you can go talk to him, qualify some doubts. So I think I'm not alone when I say, Peter, thank you for the great service you do to this community. You're most welcome. Thank you for the presentations. Yep. Thank you, everyone. You couldn't do anything without you. Thanks. All right, let's wait a minute for people to put down their questions if there's any still. And uh, after that, we can take it from there. I know Thomas had to drop, but uh, I wanted to thank him as well. He, he did a great job teeing up, queuing up uh, everything from the theoretical perspective from the IETF and then be nice to tie it all together in the end. Okay. Uh, there is, sorry, Jennifer asks, is the API that Raphael showed final? Definitely not. <laughs> Possibly some endpoints will, uh, will remain. I would say, uh, well, transact, probably the parameters will change. So I, I would say 
uh, either the endpoints or the parameters. Ev everything will likely change. This is the first attempt, but only makes sense to have a finalized version of the API once we discuss in the in, in the ITF forum. This is a collaborative effort, and uh, this API was mostly me and Andre Augusto defining it for our um, impl for impl implementation purposes because it would facilitate testing. Yep, I would like to add to that that even though some of the implementation details may not be completely final, I'm pretty confident that the overall ideas that are rooted in very, very uh, battle-tested principles that are coming all the way back from the 80s, so because it all rests on those foundations, I would still encourage you to try and learn and uh, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the principles presented here because it will definitely give you a leg up on uh, understanding the system as a whole later on. And we have Jatson raising his hand, so please go ahead. Uh, hello, yeah. I am also an applicant of the uh, mentorship program that CAPTA is having. So if you could provide mo uh, uh, some more information on it, like when uh, will it be shortlisted and all? We are working on that, Jatin. Sorry about that. So, But within the next week, we will we'll finalize. We will, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions, no raised hands. So with that said, I think we're done. Thank, thanks everyone for joining, presenting and participating in general. And thank you very much for David Boswell and the Hyper Ledger Foundation for making this possible, the technical details, all the infrastructure behind it. It was a tremendous amount of help. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad it went well. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And um, Peter and the others, I'll follow up with you later about, you know, getting the email out and, you know, all the kind of wrap up stuff. But thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Bye. one. Bye-bye.